Oh, the praties, they are small Over here, over here The praties, they are small Over here Oh, the praties, they are small And way up in Donegal We ate them skins and all Over here Oh, we ate them skins and all Over here Come with me on a journey, not across miles, but years, to a land now known for its laughter, to a time it was known for its tears. On the highest hill of Gros Eel, an island now known as Ile des Irlandais, the island of the Irish, stands a memorial to the victims of Ireland's great hunger, an important yet neglected story. Why are there so few who even know it happened? My name is Mike McCormick, and I'm the National Historian for the Ancient Order of Hibernians, the largest Irish cultural organization in America. Behind me stands that memorial, the tallest Celtic cross in the world, erected by the Ancient Order of Hibernians on Gros Eel, a quarantine station in the St. Lawrence River off Quebec. It was erected in 1909 in memory of the thousands of Irish who died here in a single year, 1847. More than 6,000 in one mass grave alone. And that's just a small portion of the total number who died trying to escape starvation and disease in Ireland's great hunger of 1845 through 1850 and beyond. Isn't it strange that so many of the American people who are known for their compassion for justice and deep interest in human rights know little or nothing about this tragedy or the distress of the Irish at the time? James Hack Took, a Quaker philanthropist and businessman, visited the west of Ireland at the time and he wrote the following. I have visited the wasted remnants of the once noble red man on his reservation grounds in North America and explored the Negro quarters of the degraded and enslaved African. But never have I seen misery so intense or physical degradation so complete as among the dwellers in the bog holes of Ireland. In justice against the Indians, as we called Native Americans, the sadness of slavery and the horrors of the Holocaust have all been loudly lamented in recitation, novel, and drama, in our literature, on stage, and on the screen. Yet we ignore one of the greatest human tragedies in Western history, especially when it had such a major impact on America's own history. The reason for that lies in our system of education. In 1781, when America won her independence from the crown, we evicted everything British, her form of government, her monetary system, her laws, everything that is except her system of education. Our forefathers were taught by English teachers, and the generations that followed were taught by students of that English education, and used English-influenced school books that naturally had omitted the transgressions of the British Empire. We still do. Check our children's school books and see what you find there, or more to the point, what you won't find there. When we learned history in grade school, we learned how Spanish conquistadors plundered the New World, but we never learned how the British abused America's natives. Years later, when I learned that, I wondered why I hadn't read that in school. Then I realized that we learned how the French victimized the Native Americans, but not how the British gave them smallpox-infected blankets during the French and Indian War. Neither did we learn what the British did to the Arcadians, the Chinese, and the people of India, among others. The pattern is obvious. World history, as we were taught it, had eliminated the sins of the British Empire. That is especially true with regard to the Irish. Not only were injustices against the Irish concealed, but the contributions of the Irish were excluded in order to justify the need their guidance and colonial domination. Those who attended American schools can verify that the tribulations and the contributions of the Irish were absent from our texts. We were taught a revised version of history. It was, in fact, 
a conspiracy of silence. Add to that the fact that those who suffered had few opportunities to leave written records, and you see why we learned little or nothing about the great hunger. That's why the memory of that tragedy has been neglected. But when you learn the truth, I'm sure you'll want to help rectify that neglect and tell that story. As the 150th anniversary of the Great Hunger approached in 1995, America had matured to an unprecedented concern for civil rights. Our educators took the lead in enforcing that attitude by revealing the truths of our own transgressions with regard to the treatment of Native Americans, slavery, and other issues. This renewed concern for human rights naturally influenced new studies being done on the great hunger as old documents and periodicals were researched and reprinted. The British Public Record Office claimed that the regimental activity reports of 1845 through 1850 had somehow gone missing and so were the receipts issued by commissariat officers tallying the tons of food exported during that time frame. But other records were found to provide that missing data. Amid that new information were also items that proved that previous omissions had been in fact deliberate rather than an innocent oversight. For there was evidence of contradicting disinformation and revised statistics designed to minimize the catastrophe and diminish its impact. History had been rewritten. Now when it comes to the truth of the past, omission is wrong, but distortion is criminal. For no one has a right to alter the past. We are only history's curators, not its creators. That is why fair-minded educators in many states have already added the great hunger to their curriculum right alongside the Holocaust and slavery. As new research began to reveal long hidden facts, a few well-credentialed people who should have known better rushed to lecture about the Great Famine, as they called it. Surprisingly, they said it was all over in 1847 because of a slight improvement in the year-end harvest. They even said that although it was a sad time, nothing could have been done because, after all, even the landlords themselves were starving. Now, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but no one is entitled to their own facts. Was that conclusion total ignorance or another shameless deception? They compared 1840s Ireland to Bangladesh. There is no comparison. Four times as many starved in Ireland as did in Bangladesh, and from a population only one-tenth the size. Secondly, the regions in Bangladesh experienced a general lack of food, and relief efforts were hampered by poor roads and floods and civil war. In Ireland, there was no civil war, no floods, and the roads were adequate. People starved outside the gates of prosperous farms and within reach of storage bins of surplus grain. And the landlords did not starve. Newspapers of the day which reported death tolls among the Irish also reported cotillions and balls at the landlords' estates. And it wasn't over in 47 either. In fact, 1847 recorded the highest death toll in the entire five-year period. As the many oppressive factors persecuting the Irish tenant farmer began to be documented, the question arose, why would anyone say such things? Were they the victims of revised history as we were, or were they the revisionist historians themselves? If the latter, what hidden agenda could they have had that would make them want to rewrite the past? It wasn't long before we learned the answer. There were those who felt that the truth would only inflame emotions and add fuel to a fire that was still burning in Northern Ireland. But they needn't have worried about reminding the Northern Irish, for the Northern Irish had not forgotten. Now, some might consider that politically expedient, but what they were really doing was burying the truth about the persecution of their ancestors for political ends. And what an insult to those who perished for they slandered their memory by shifting the blame to the Irish themselves. 
As a result of their disinformation, people asked, why didn't the Irish just grow something else? Or why didn't they go fishing for their food? People began to believe that the Irish could have avoided this tragedy, and it was through their own laziness and lack of industry that they starved. Author John Mitchell wrote at the time, the Almighty indeed sent the potato blight, but England created the famine. CNN's Joel Hockmuth asked that very question in a 1997 documentary. The whole famine story is full of irony. Why did so many in Ireland have to starve when next door was the richest nation in the world? The Irish people died because the British government turned their back on them. It's as simple as that. I think we just need to be careful not to lose sight of whatever responsibilities there may have been within Irish society itself potatoes. Disaster struck in 1845 when a blight arrived that would wipe out the crops several years in a row. When the Great Hunger did finally come in 1845 through 50, it was no surprise. The British had several commissions and uh, uh, groups that had gone to Ireland, official groups that had gone to Ireland to study the, uh, the situation in Ireland. And they knew that the Irish were living on the verge of starvation. And all of Ireland was under British rule. The question is, why didn't Britain use its vast wealth and give away food to its starving neighbors? You can build in all kinds of long-term dependencies, which, which causes a collapse of the existing economic system. I don't know if it would destroy the whole uh, home economy. It would certainly uh, upset the home economy. But in favor of what it was accomplishing, saving millions from starvation, I think that that was a, a reasonable risk. And very little was done to help. Now, we don't hold anyone responsible for the sins of their fathers any more than we will accept the sins of ours. Nor can we blame a people when unprincipled opportunists manage to accede to positions of power within their monarchy, even for a short period of time. But we cannot erase what happened nor ignore the lessons of history. How different would we be from those who turned their backs on their suffering if we turned our backs on their memory? Further. We cannot allow history to be changed when it affects so many. Each of the more than 36 million Americans who claim an Irish heritage had a relative, distant or not, whether they knew them or not, who suffered in that horror, and they did nothing to deserve it. Those who are not of Irish ancestry should also know the tribulations of the Irish, along with those of the Native Americans, the Africans and Jews, and all those who had no one to speak out for them at the time of their hardship. They should also know that although the Great Hunger started as a natural disaster affecting only one part of the population, it was compounded into a greater tragedy since it occurred at a time when selfish interests dictated official policies. And that's why it's so important to scrutinize those who were in control and the reasoning behind their actions or inaction, to examine their policies and doctrines such as laissez-faire and related import and export laws, especially in this era of a free trade economy. It's also important to see to what extent public assistance, workhouse and soup kitchens were administered in the context of the time and attitudes. Well, learning the mistakes of the past ensures that they will not be repeated, even unintentionally. There are so many lessons to be learned from this tragedy, including why the Irish call it on Gorta Moor, which translates the Great Hunger, not the Great Famine. Even though some authors still refer to it simply as the Famine, they are deliberately or unwittingly picking up the terminology used by officials at the time or by those fallacious authors dedicated to minimizing the catastrophe. Revision can mean change for good as well as for bad. And as history can be revised to mislead, it can also be revised to correct. It's time to set the record straight. It is therefore incumbent upon us to counteract any erroneous interpretations associated with this watershed in world history by promoting the truth of what happened. And that is why we prepared this brief report, and that is why we need your help to share this information with your students. Next, we will tell you what led to the Great Hunger.